Hi, hello and welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. I'm Frederick and I use my background in archaeology to examine these strange claims that you encounter on your telly. This is uh, the last chapter in the ancient apocalypse saga. And we started this whole journey by examining where Graham Hancock got um, some of his inspiration for his writings. And we have since then gone through different places that Hancock claims is evidence for uh, ancient lost ice age civilizations. And it's not gone too well for Hancock so far when we looked a bit more deeper and skeptically at the different places and myths that he has declared to be evidence for his ideas. And if you start here... Don't worry, you can um, see these episodes or listen to them out of order, but I recommend later on go back to episode 30 where we started this journey and follow us from the beginning. And this is episode 33 and we have some fun things to discuss. First we head out to the Bahamas and visited Bimini Road. We actually looked at this site previously back in episode 10 when we went with Graham Hancock actually when he went on Ancient Aliens in the episode Underwater Worlds. And then we will get into some old map, especially Piro Ray's map that's said to describe very accurately the entirely of the known world and we learned that uh, things aren't maybe as they always seem to be. Later we were visited by Jens Notroff who uh, has worked previously on Gobli Tepe and he will share some of his knowledge about the site and we will close out the episode by examining the archie astronomical claims presented in the show by Martin Sweatman. And remember that you find sources, resources and further reading suggestions at our website diggingupancientaliens.com. There you will also find the contact info if you notice any mistakes or have any suggestions. And if you like the podcast, I would appreciate if you left one of those fancy five-star reviews that I heard so much about. And if you're viewing this on YouTube, well, give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Now we're finished with the preparations. Let's dig into the episode. Bimini is a tropical paradise in the heart of Bahamas. Not more than a skip and a jump from Miami. And this small island might be pint-sized, but it packs a punch when it comes to natural beauty. Imagine diving in the crystal clear turquoise waters and swimming among schools of vibrant fish and graceful sea turtles, or longing on one of Bimini's pristine beaches feeling the soft sands between your toes and listening to the gentle waves lapping at the shore. Oh, it's pure bliss. But Bimini is more than a pretty face. The island has a rich history of culture and you can explore its fascinating remnants of the rum running past. And the Bimini Museum is also a must-see with um, exhibits uh, celebrating the island's unique heritage. But over here for rum and beaches, sadly, no. (laughs) Our drinks served in coconuts with little umbrellas has to wait for another time. We're here due to the geological feature called Bimini Road, a formation that Hancock regards uh, to be evidence of his lost ancient civilization back in episode 3 ghost of the drowned world. Now the whole episode starts with some more laminating about archaeologists who do not want to do research therefore no scientific study has occurred at Bimini Road. But how did this row of rocks become a thesis for the locations of Atlantis? I give you a hint. Its origin is from one of our well usual suspects. Can you guess who? I'll give you some time. If you thought it was Edgar Cayce, great job! Edgar Cayce, or the Sleeping Prophet, a by now familiar name to us, is, uh, if not the creator, at least the inspiration for Bimini Road. 
Edgar did speak on Atlantis and Bimini Islands a couple of times, and if you go online you will find, uh, trying to find information about Bimini Road, you will most likely stumble upon one of Edgar Cayce's supposed readings that goes as follow. A portion of the temples may yet be discovered under the slime of ages and the seawater near Bimini. Expect it in 68 or 69, not so far away. Now, if you start to dig around in this quote, you will learn that the first part comes from a vision in 1933. Casey here talks about where blueprints for some sort of Atlantean power source will be found. And these blueprints are stored, well, according to Casey, in three locations in Egypt, in Yucatan, and, well, quote, in the sunken portion of Atlantis, or Poseidia, where a portion of the temples may yet be discovered under the slime of ages of seawater, near what is known as a Bimini of the coast of Florida. As for the second part of that quote, we don't find it until 1938 in Prophecy 958-3. But as a date for when Atlantis will again rise up out of the water. And Poseidia will be among the first portions of Atlantis to rise again. Expected in 68 or 69, not so far away. So it seems as the 68 or 69 dates has added to the quote later to make his um, claim more accurate. You see, supporters of cases did, in a lack for better word, discover Bimini Road in 1968, so to get, you know, the master to have, <laughs> have been right all this time, they declared the discovery and the prophecy was connected. The team who found the rock and Hancock both agree on that uh, this simply can't be natural formation. Nature can't create these type of structures, but... If there's something nature is incredible good at, is creating incredible shapes, something all new archaeologists discovered during their first excavation or during their field school. What we're looking at and what Hancock claims is wrong or impossible in his show is uh, simply beach rocks, a distinctive and rapidly forming type of rock that develops near intertidal levels at the beach. The secret to its formation lays in the regular tidal fluxes that forces um, calcium carbonate rich water through the sand. Scientists believe that the combination of evaporation and offgassing of carbon dioxide help trigger the perspiration of calcium carbonate. And over time, Tiny, tiny argonite crystals uh, start to form between the sand grids, and these crystals, they act like, uh, like glue, gradually, gradually uniting the grains to um, create a sort of hardened limestone. And the result is a stunning and unique rock that we today know as beach rock. I also want to point out that these pillow-formed stones are found in other locations too. As James Randi pointed out, these can be found in Australia, for example, and he wondered if maybe the Atlanteans had some sort of um, enclave over there too, even though nobody else seemed to believe that. That was a joke. <laughs> And this process doesn't need much time to form. We have examples of human skeleton remains and even World War II artifacts that's embedded in this type of rock. Several different tests have actually been carried out on the site, opposite to what Hancock claims. For example, Shin and Tompkinskin took 17 core drillings and when analyzed they revealed that these blocks all have a identical strata. We would not expect to see this in quarried blocks since they come from different places at the quarry, but we know that this is something that we actually would expect if this was natural formation like beach rock. And a great thing about limestone is that it tends to incorporate uh, organic material. 
And due to this, we can actually C14 date this type of rock, or rather, we can date the organic material within the stone, and it has been done. Several samples were taken from the Bimini stones, and the oldest date found was from around 3510 BP. So the rocks are not even formed when Atlantis, according to Hancock and all the other people, claims that it was destroyed. Something Hancock's leave out of the whole discussion, but we're, we're not done there. Another big issue for Hancock's theory is that the Atlantic Ocean simply don't have room for a sunken continent here. Our understanding of the movement of the tectonic plates indicated that a continent could not have been submerged in the Atlantic. And with all these things in mind, it's quite um, strange that Hancock claimed that mainstream science refused to investigate the Bimini Road. As we've discussed, scientists have looked into the claims from its discovery of the site, and nothing has been there. We stopped simply, spent time and money looking into it. I, I n don't know if Hancock is aware that this test has uh, occurred or that this investigation has performed, but if people want to take him seriously, he should at least read this test and maybe he should start to finance uh, new tests. If the second round of tests shows a different result than the initial test, maybe we need to reopen the investigation. Maybe need to reopen. But as the evidence is right now, it's solid as a rock and there's nothing more than well rocks <laughs> Now, maybe one of the more strange segments throughout the series found in the same episode as Bimini Road, of course. While on a boat in the clear Bahaman waters, Hancock brings up a copy of Piri Ray's map. Now, Piri Ray, or Mohammed Muadin Piri, was an admiral within the Ottoman fleet and a Photographer who lived between 1465 and 1553 CE. While he did some of the most uh, detailed maps of the Mediterranean Sea, he is maybe most known for his world map. Originally, this map was in four parts, but sadly, only one piece, the one depicting the southwest map, has uh, survived until our days. On this map, Piri Reis lists his sources for the map as follow-ups. No such map exists in our age. Your humble servant is its author and brought it into being. It's based mainly on 20 shards and Mapamundi, one of which is drawn in the time of Alexander the Great and is known to the Arab as Cafayere. This map is the result of comparison with eight such uh, Cafayere maps, one Arab map of India, four new Portuguese maps drawn according to the geometrical methods of India and China, and also the map of the western lands drawn by Columbus, such that this map of the Seven Sea is as accurate and reliable as the latter map of this region. Now both Hancock and I can agree that Pirure existed and he drew quite accurate maps for his time, but Graham, well has some, as usual, rather exciting ideas on how we should interpret this world map by Pierre Ray. First, Graham commits a fairly common mistake. He, well, the island he points out as Cuba is not, in fact, Cuba. So when he says, uh, quote, effort has been made to explain it as a badly drawn map of Cuba and that doesn't just fly for me, because you can't get that wrong. He is actually correct, and if we read what uh, Piri wrote on the island on the map, we know that he's called this uh, Hispaniola. Today this is part of the Dominican Republic and the location of the first Spanish colonization attempt. 
La Isabella. And if you look at it, you will note that the island, first of all, is facing in the wrong direction. Direct in, if we compare it to you know, modern maps, the east coast has become the north coast, for example. But it's not uncommon that uh, some land masses were turned for some reason on all the maps. For example, we see Greenland twisting about 90 degrees more than once. It's <laughs> twisted on several maps. Hispaniola might have been rotated 90 degrees because Columbus, when he first arrived at the New World, thought that he had come to um, Kipango. And if we compare ma other maps from this era, such as uh, Beaming Globe, Bardon, and Isolarium, we notice that Piri Pure race map match up quite well with their renditions of uh, Kipango or Japan as we know it today. But where is Cuba? Well, Columbus and other explorers thought that today's Cuba was actually part of the mainland. So we find it above Panama. So much for the eerie, accurate map that Hancock claims that this is. Now, Pirates has marked this location as Cabo y Punta Ornofai. Today, this area is close to Rio San Juan. And it's pretty clear that Piri based this map segment on Columbus' idea that this was a large mass landmass that was stretching far up north. All right, so the map might not be as accurate as depicted in popular media, but how about the idea that Piru Ray has drawn Bimini Road on the map? Now, Hancock claims that on the island we now know it depicts Hispaniola, a row of blocks can't be mountain. Graham reasons uh, for this is that Piru Ray supposedly drew mountains way, way differently. Since it's not a mountain range, well, it has to be Bimini Road. Except Pire drew other maps. Take, for example, his book on Mediterranean maps named Kitab i Bahireye. In it, we find maps of Crete, Sicily, and other locations that do have mountains, which look rather the same as what we see on this world map. So it seems as we doesn't really have much luck with Hancock's claims regarding the northern part of the map. But what about uh, the fact that it actually depicts Antarctica? Does mainstream science have any clever explanations for that? Well, as a matter of fact, we, we do. First of all, if what we see here is not part of South America, did, did the cartographer just draw Brazil and then just skipped directly to Antarctica. And if that were the case, wouldn't it be more logical if they left a little gap between Brazil and Antarctica and just not connect it all the way? Well, if we were to straighten the curl up part, it would be a better match for Argentina and the Falkland Islands, for example, than Antarctica. And we should not forget the, the explanations that Piri wrote about the different areas on the map. Looking a bit closer, we see that part of Antarctica, or Antarctica within quotation, describes by Piri Reis as follow. This country is barren. Everything is desolate and it ruins and it's said that large serpents are found here. For this reason the Portuguese infidels did not land on these shores and these shores are said to be very hot. About the small island it's claimed that these islands are not inhabited but spices are plentiful. Not really how we would describe Antarctica, right? You might now yell, stop. What about the other map from Orontios uh, Phineas? Well, this 1531 map is one of those cases where if you start to read what the creator wrote on the map, the mystery kind of just disappear. For the landmass, some suggest is Antarctica. He has written the southern land recently discovered, but not yet completely known. And if we read the longer legend at the bottom, we learn that Phineas did not base this map on other older maps. But these are brand new. 
And the land area that Phineas called Terra Australis is most likely Terra del Fuego, discovered just a couple of years earlier, 10 years earlier in 1520. But the idea of a southern landmass had already theorized by Ptolemy around 2nd century CE. So when the news about Tierra del Fuego reached Phineas, he wrote it in as a theorized landmass, but added that it was not yet adequately explored. Hancock's claims regarding Bimini Road and Pirates map seems highly unlikely now that we know more about these sites and these maps. Like sand castles, they crumble and are washed away by the waves of knowledge. But let's leave these sand beaches and our coconut drinks for now at least. We will head back east and investigate a site that Hancock speculates is a warning. A warning from the past. Welcome to the Urfa province in southwest Turkey. In this semi-airy Mediterranean landscape located in the steep hills beneath the Taurus mountains, we find an extraordinary site, Göbekli Tepe, possibly one of the oldest megalithic sites. I could have myself talked about the site, but I decided to bring in an absolute ringer. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our next guest. And then I want to welcome Jens Nostroff to the show. Welcome Jens. Yeah, hi and thanks for having me. Would you mind maybe introduce yourself a little bit to the audience that might not be too familiar with your work previously? Yes, of course. Um, my name is Jens, Jens uh, Notroff. I am an archaeologist currently working or for some time already working at the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin and I was many, many years, I think more than 12 or 13 years, involved in the excavations at pre-pottery Neolithic uh, Göbekli Tepe, which uh, probably is a uh, is familiar to to some of your viewers and yeah where we were uh, directing uh, excavations working at the site together with the local museum in in Schanlofa. you have been involved in the tepe telegrams it's a sort of blog as i come to understand it would you mind maybe share a little bit on that project how it came to be yeah that's uh, that's quite an interesting question because there, there was a point when the the site of Göbekli tepe reached some uh, recognition in the media and there was a lot of uh, popular media reporting about it and thus a lot of people were interested in the archaeology of the site uh, and the finds and we soon noticed that the actual academic work that the actual research results were pretty much almost invisible in the in the public discussion of of the site and a lot of the narratives which were floating around were dominated by, yeah, let's say, distorted, uh, distorted ideas about the site or plain wrong uh, information about the excavations <laughs> and and the finds until a point there it it really yeah pretty much dove into into pseudo archaeology. So really the mm. uh, factual, totally wrong kind of of information floating around and being multiplied in the discussion. And we thought, okay, something's going going bad if the actual research data, which is available, which is there, is is pretty much not noticed in this whole discussion. And that was the idea to make it much more accessible when in academic journals or on conferences and to have hmm. this kind of online repository um, with information, with basic information about the site and with our ongoing research, ongoing excavations, just to offer a small glimpse into the in the state of research and, and work. And it worked in the end. Um, the the blog the format was a blog format, was was well well received and uh, read. Yeah. And when we talk about Göbekli Tepe, what do we really refer to then? Is it a religious site or ah yeah, yeah. hitting hitting the, the hot spot <laughs> right right away. Or if you if we uh, forward 
back a little bit. Uh, what is Gubbly Tap and when was it discovered? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Let's maybe let's start this way. Um, the site is already yeah. known as a as a Neolithic site since uh, a survey in the 1960s, a joint survey by the universities of Chicago and Istanbul. And the report about this was published a bit later in the 80s. And there it notes that um, among many Neolithic sites in the region, uh, some of them already excavated, for example, like a uh, famous Chayunu, um, that this, null, uh, this uh, small mound of Gabekli Tepe was noteworthy because a lot of flintstone tools and flintstone debris was lying around. Hmm. And thus it was entered in, in this list. But more or less forgotten because there was nothing else significantly to be observed uh, on, on first glance. When in the 1990s, in 1994, I think, Klaus Schmidt, the uh, former project leader of the uh, Gobekli Tepe excavations, um, was um, with this list in hand, this survey list in hand, uh, visiting the area, visiting some of the places uh, noted on this list. He also went to Gobekli Tepe. And he had the advantage that he previously worked on another site nearby at Nevalichori, where hmm. for the first time these characteristic T-shaped pillars were discovered of the smaller kind. Nevalichori dates a bit later than, than uh, Göbekli Tepe. It's also a Neolithic site, but it resembles more what we also found at Göbekli Tepe, uh, the smaller structures, the smaller pillars with a height of uh, two meters, uh, about two meters or, or, or less. And with this knowledge, he was able to recognize that some of the stone, small stone parts sticking out of the surface at Göbekli Tepe were indeed worked stones much resembling the tops of these T-shaped pillars. And of course, this caught his, his interest, his attraction. And mm. that's how um, excavation work started there, together with the uh, local museum in, in Shanleo for the next biggest city and funded by the German Research Foundation and uh, in a, yeah, ending up in a large-scale research project at the Orient Department and the Istanbul Department of the German Archaeological Institute. And uh, the dating of the site, mm -hmm. what is it uh, dated to currently and how has this date been um, concluded? Yeah, what yeah. evidence do we have for it currently? So currently... Um, the site dates to the pre-pottery Neolithic, that is the 10th millennium uh, BC. Basically, pre-pottery Neolithic phase A and B. So um, this is the the chronological or the relative chronological background we are we are moving in. These results are first and of all, of course, uh, achieved by dating the material culture. Uh, through the uh, typical archaeological method, through comparison and analogies, there are very typical stone tools uh, like projectile points, arrowheads, but also blades and knives. And they all are, without a question, uh, dating to, to the pre-pottery and Neolithic culture, because we know these tools from many, many other sites since the, mm. the, the whole culture complex was defined in the 1950s by, by Kathleen Kenyon. But of course, um, this is not the only, uh, only basis of, of the chronology at, at Gobekli Tepe. We also did some other testings and uh, some other methods where we used to, to obtain data for, for the finds and features. For example, uh, most famously, uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, there are yeah. some uh, some pieces of charcoal found in the wall plaster of some of the walls at Göbekli Tepe, which date uh, to the 10th millennium BC, and at least give us a date when this wall plaster was applied to to the wall. Um, other dates are coming from from inside the wall, from the mortar between uh, beyond the wall. So um, there is some reliable radiocarbon dates, definitely supporting the already achieved archaeological dating. And uh, do we know for about how long the site was in use, especially the more temple-like area, I think mm. the question is. Yeah, I mean, um, since we're covering uh, um, pre-pottery Neolithic phase A and B, there is some use time visible there. It's not quite clear, at least that, that, that was my latest uh, state of knowledge. Of course, work is going on and with all the other sites around being excavated, this picture mm is uh, certainly changing uh, over time. Uh, what I wanted to say is that it's not quite clear if there was a constant occupation, constant use of the site, 
or if there was a recurring use and people were coming back, uh, repairing sites, reusing sites. So overall, with, um, with the latest structures, we certainly have a, a use time going well into the 8th, 8th millennium BC. So it's quite a long or longer time of, of use of people being present at the site. The site is usually, if we go back to these more fringe ideas presented as something that uh, broke archaeology, why this notion often repeated on how it Tepe broke or mm -hmm. revolutionized idea within archaeology. Yeah, I, I'm aware of these, uh, these narratives that it, uh, it forces us to, to rethink and rewrite our, our previous image of, of hunter-gatherers. Um, which might have to do with a uh, distorted idea of what we thought about uh, hunter-gatherers um, mm. uh, previously. I think a lot of, of the discussion being repeated is drawing from a very, very old concept mm. of uh, the Neolithic. Um, and it's not reflecting uh, the last 50 years of, of ongoing <laughs> research um, where... I mean, Göbekli Tepe in the beginning seemed like a special outlier, but it was not totally unexpected. We knew about uh, monumental architecture um, related mm. to the pre-Pottery Neolithic from the excavations at Jericho, for example. This famous tower yeah. um, already is a quite impressive monument. We already knew about the, the need of repeated gatherings of, of mobile groups to exchange information, to uh, strengthen social cohesion and so on from his from historic analogies, from ethnographic analogies, and also from the archaeological record. If you're looking at, at the Natufian sites, for example, where the similar ideas were already discussed. So Gobekli Tepe seemed so special also to archaeologists because it was this, this strong focus on, on monumental architecture, which was all there mm. and which was a huge site compared to uh, to other sites of 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 the period when we are looking at the settlements we already knew from Chayuni, for example, which has a very distinct architecture as well, and also occasionally these special purpose buildings, but not in this massive massive focus it's this large number of special purpose buildings. So this was quite interesting, but meantime, with a lot of other sites in the area under excavation. This image also is getting quite sharper and it shows us that this is a very specific phenomenon of the local culture. So Gebekli Tepe is not an outlier, it's not an exception. It's part of a number of larger sites uh, in the very yeah. region. Probably uh, we, were, we were defining it by looking at the at other parts of the material culture and the iconography, architecture. So we may cover an area of almost 200 kilometers in the in the surroundings, covering uh, this communication zone of, of this community, if you would like to put it like this. And do we know anything about how the construction went? Did they use stones that was available local or was it importing? Uh, have the, you found any yeah. tools? Uh, the, the, we're in the lucky situation where the, the quarries are right next to the actual mound. So the, the rock plateau surrounding okay. the Mount of Göbekli Tepe and this is there, the quarries are situated as well. And they know this because we, for, for one, we found the, the negative shapes where stones were removed. We also found atelier situations where half finished or the remains of finished tea pillars were lying hmm. around and a lot of tools were lying around as well. So we know which tools were used as well. And we are so sure that we found the quarries because there are some unfinished tea pillars still in the quarries. As they were broken at some point and those are not used anymore, uh, not not transported these like 300 meters or what it is to, to the mound. So we know where the stone is coming from. We know the tools. So there's, there's really no big mystery about how we made it. Of course, we cannot say for sure how they were moving down from A to B because we were not there. But we yeah. see that they cleared a path. There are There's a lot of sediment, for example, on the rock plateau as well, which must have coming from somewhere. So the idea that they maybe used uh, soil or something to, to get kind of a pathway is something we, we might discuss. Um, there are ideas... That's the thing in archaeology. We don't know the truth. And, and we, but we can offer 
possible scenarios and explanations. And we are, we're fair enough to admit when we don't know something, uh, maybe <laughs> this is what makes the real research data less sexy than, than these absolute uh, uh, narratives coming from, from other, other actors. Yeah, it's hard to compete like, with levitation guns and whatever yeah. ancient aliens have uh, proposed for moving these blocks. But do you know what sort of uh, material? Is it tough? I know that Turkey is usually quite volcanic. Is mm. it tough? Or... There, there is a volcanic stone around, basalt mostly, which was used for, for vessels uh, in particular and mm. for, for grinding stones. The pillars themselves are made from limestone, local limestone, which is, and this is yeah. also uh, uh, quite a nice explanation or a nice contribution to how I actually uh, crafted these pillars. The limestone there is uh, naturally appearing in, in, in layers of banks. So there's all, hmm. all, always a bank of limestone of a certain thickness. And if you want to cut such a raw pillar from, from the, the stone, you basically just follow these banks and remove these banks of stones. The limestone is rather soft. It's easily worked with, with flintstone. Um, for sure, I tried this. Um, I, I can <laughs> personally personally confirm that this is possible. Um, so it's there's no magic needed to, to cut the local limestone with the available tools uh, at that time. Do we know what it might have? Uh, I know that Hancock talked a lot about astronomical alignments within the site. Are we aware about any or how is the, or has it been any studies on art astro-archaeology on the site uh, this this definitely is is a topic we are also we were also looking into and something i personally wouldn't exclude because um if there is a possibility that there is a relation to people observing the sky of course that would be an interesting observation and we know from other sites like famously for example stonehenge that um there yeah. are certain concepts integrated in the architecture as well. The thing about Göbekli Tepe is that, to my knowledge so far, there is no convincing evidence to link any astronomic phenomenon to the alignment of the pillars. And all the things discussed so far, and we addressed, we basically usually address these things on the blog as well, mm. are not convincing because they either are drawing from a very small number of samples, basically cherry picking uh, just a few examples and explaining these, but leaving out the total rest, which then would remain uh, unexplained and was relying on rather anecdotal data, or they are not keeping in mind that what we are seeing at Göbekli Tepe is just the last part of a very long activity at the site. We know for sure that there was a lot of rebuilding and rearranging activity happening over mm. time and that pillars were reused at, at uh, other enclosures, at other buildings. Um, some pillars are now obviously uh, standing in the wrong place in the wrong place compared to their original position. Some are turned around, some are reworked, um, older reliefs are erased, new reliefs are, are added. So if there was a certain meaning to the arrangement of the pillars, it was changed multiple times. And this makes it very yeah. difficult for me to project a certain, certain concept to the layout and the uh, should not forget that a lot of the building historical research done on the site suggests that the these buildings were uh, subterranean and probably likely roofed. So this again makes direct direct connection of the pillars and something happening in the sky rather difficult, in my opinion. When was the site abandoned? Do we know if there was any? I know Hancock bring up that it was ritually buried is this true or do we know since you bring up that there's half finished peep pieces was it a sudden abandonment mm. or was it a yeah, planned I mean, abandonment now we're touching a topic which makes it difficult to to be conclusive here because this is an ongoing excavation so yeah. we're, the the colleagues are still working on the site where still excavated new finds and features and of course over time with new finds, our our uh, interpretation may change as well. And it did here so too. I know that in the beginning, 
uh, one of the ideas we were discussing that maybe the the burial of the enclosures was part of their construction concept from the very beginning that it was the idea mm. already to bury these these buildings um this is an idea coming basically from the uh huge 5.5 meter high pillars being being founded in very shallow pedestals and we really had a difficult time to imagine how these pillars might have stand upright for such a long time if there was no kind of backfilling supporting supporting the pillars meanwhile with, with further excavation and further building research and the discussion of maybe uh, a roof putting pressure from above on on these pillars or maybe wooden uh, constructions supporting the pillars as well and um, there's a lot more more dynamic in the discussion of uh, how these backfilling events happened actually i mean they were backfilled in the end because we we are now excavating them yeah. so the sediment must have come from somewhere the, the 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 filling of these these buildings seemed very homogeneous in the first process of excavation there was a lot of rubble from the from the quarries there was a lot of stone tools a lot of bones um remains of of meals uh, actually a lot of hunted animals this is by the way why we know that the the economy of the people active at Gabakli Tepe were hunter gatherers all the animals mm. and plants found so far there or the remains of animals and plants are strictly wild species hunted species but to return to the to the to the filling events we now with a lot of stratigraphic analysis and building history uh, building historical analysis we now have a much much more differentiated picture available of, of what happened there and this Hmm. This is research still in progress and not not finished. This seems as of yet that we have to uh, think of both intentional backfilling events at some point may, and also natural filling events, uh, for example, by, by earthquakes or erosion. And these, these yeah. two events may well be linked together as well because um, maybe if uh, the site was not in use for a certain time and then... Uh, an earthquake happened, uh, some things were, were toppled over, walls were collapsing, um, people were returning. They may have just cleaned it, but not removed all the rubble. So this is where, where these natural and artificial filling events may go well hand in hand and also over a longer time than we maybe originally thought. But again, this is work in research and I don't want to to take away any information from the colleagues still working there and still coming up with uh, with an interpretation for all of this. No, and that's something important to keep in mind with archaeology. It's a science like much else and information changes as new research yeah. is conducted. And we're happy to admit this. So um, this, yeah. this idea <laughs> that there is a secret archaeological dogma and we want to, we want to defend this dogma of forever is is ridiculous because if if there's one thing changing constantly in archaeology it's our idea of uh, of what these finds might represent and we're happy to get new yeah. ideas and to get a step further <laughs> to get uh, another puzzle piece for for the picture so yeah yeah that's the whole idea with with the science and why many of us got into it from the start yeah. to learn new things it's not that we want to sit and read the same book over and over <laughs> until we retire <laughs> but uh, Jens I will let you um, go is there anywhere listeners or viewers can go to read more of you or uh, um, I definitely recommend to have a look at the uh, Tepe Telegrams blog which will be relaunched or oh, which has been relaunched after break um, over the, the, the pandemic work on site was also limited. So colleagues were, were working a lot with the finds, but now um, I'm expecting to that the blog will, will show new information and inform about ongoing work and research. And maybe, yeah, I think there's also a lot of further literature collected and what people would like to to, to read or to find further information. There's an FAQ about the site. So I think this would be the, f the first resource I, I'd suggest to, uh, to visit for a site. There also the idea is discussed what the site actually is, which is not easy. Um, it's probably not a temple or a ritual site or only a ritual site as has been discussed in, in a lot mm. of formats. But um, we would like to call it a social hub, a meeting place for people because this notion of Ritual versus profane is a very, very modern distinction and does not have at all to be applied to the prehistoric people using the site 
as well. Yeah, yeah. Religion can be a communal sense, yeah. so to say, as we see in other culture that you can have a social gather gathering combined with exactly. a ritual service at the same time. Jens, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for your time, Jens. And uh, his website and project links can be found in the show notes to this episode. Something we didn't bring up during this talk was the ideas of Martin Sweatman, who appears in the show. Or rather, Dr. Sweatman, who is by day uh, doing chemical engineering at the University of Edinburgh. But by night he is researching archaeoastronomy at Gobekli Tepe. His idea is that the builders of Gobekli Tepe did carve astronomical constellations on the pillars at the site as a message to future generations. Sweatman claims that especially one pillar we see depicting, uh, we see in the show depicting the constellation of Gemini, Scorpio, Virgi, Pisces and other Greek constellations. And these constellations Sweatman claims line up with the equinoxes as they were about 10,950 BCE plus minus 250 years, he usually adds. Why is this important? Well, it's the supposed date for when the meteoric strike in the younger Dryas impact hypothesis took place. A lot, that's a large part of uh, Hancock's theory why his super civilization disappeared. But as we learned, Gobekli Tepe wasn't constructed until the pre-pottery Neolithic A, or around the earliest 9600 BCE. Now, Sweatman hand waves this away, explaining this thousand-year gap with, uh, you know, oral traditions. But as you might have noted, I did say that uh, Sweatman used Greek constellations. These are more or less the same that we use today, but their origin is actually not Greek. The Greeks imported most of their constellation from Mesopotamia, especially from Babylonians. Now, there were some changes. They didn't just copy-paste. They, they changed it a little bit so the teacher wouldn't recognize it. I think we all know Aries, Latin for Ram, and uh, this is what the Greeks call this constellation. But... The Babylonian refer to Ares as hired worker. So there's a quite a difference between a ram and a human worker. And we see this in other signs too. Gemini, for example, Greece, twins. But among the Babylonians, it was not one set of thin twins. It was two sets of twins or a crook. Or in some cases, the true shepherd of Anu. Now, Pisces. That's two fishes in Greece, but uh, the Babylonians called this a swallow. Virgil was among the Babylonians described as a furrow, uh, the trench that um, appears when you plow your fields. While, as we know in the Greek, they call this the virgin or the maiden. Sure, there are a couple of constellations that's similar, like Scorpio, that's the same in both cultures. But most of them have their uh, unique twists between the cultures. Now, this Babylonian constellation can be traced back quite some time. The earliest account we find about them is within a document called Mola Pin. While the oldest clay tablet we have preserved is from around 700 BCE, it's argued that the texts go back a bit further than that. Some speculate it is around 1300 to 1000 BCE. Note that while these constellations go back 3000 years, it's far from the 10,000 BCE date that's suggested by Sweatman. And even if we use the 9600 BCE date, when we know that the construction probably started at Gobekli Tepe, it's still 8000 years between the earliest assumed, yeah, assumed account in Babylonian sources. And that, you know, their account would remain largely intact for 8,000 years is nearly, well, it's nearly impossible. And we know that Babylonians changed their account 
between the times we see we have these written parts and the Greeks definitely made a lot of changes rather immediately when they imported it. Sweatman and his co-author Cicrypsis, another chemical engineer, claim that a depiction of a frog, a ibex and a bird are representations of Virgil, Gemini and Pisces. The reasoning was that they feel that these symbols represent the depictions as the constellations would have looked like around 10,000 BCE. But as you know, this doesn't really match the Babylonian sources or the Greek sources. They do not really explain the difference or why there's a difference. Instead, Svetman claims it's probable and this is what they see in their reconstructions of the night sky at the time. So they have basically done a Rorschach test and declared this evidence. Sweatman and Secretis claim that they are statistically 99% accurate or correct. How they arrived to this statistical conclusion is quite dubious at best, especially when he does not present any archaeological remains to support his ideas. And as Rebecca Bradley put it, uh, they assume that the carvings are astrological groupings without testing their evidence for that assumption. Well, it's not strange that Svetman was invited from the start. He had previously written on Graham Hancock's blog and uh, is part of the YDI crowd. While he might be a decent chemical engineer, he's a quite lousy archaeologist. Well, sometimes intelligent people can be their worst enemy since they think they, well, they think they can't be fooled. Unfortunately for Sweatman, he managed to trick himself quite well. And here we will close out the Hancock saga, for now at least. Maybe we will return one day and have another look at Hancock's ideas. There are things we have left out and we have a whole bibliography to go through. Feel free to reach out and let me know if you want more of this type of contact. There's a lot of pseudo-archaeology we can look at and discuss. But next time we will be back with Giorgio and the gang to dig after more ancient aliens. But then remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can, such as iTunes, Spotify or here on YouTube. Or... Recommend us to a friend that's even better, actually. And I would also recommend you to visit diggingupancientaliens.com or ancientapocalypse.net, where you can find more info about me and the podcast. You can also find me on most social media sites if you have comments and uh, corrections or suggestions. Or if you want to write a all caps email, well, you find my contact info on the website. There you will also find all the sources and resources used to create this podcast. And you will also find further reading suggestions if you want to learn more about the subjects that we bring up. Sandra Martelor created the intro music and our outro is by the band called Trollskruv who will sing their song Tinfoil Hat. Links to both of these artists can be found in the show notes. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. Men jag skyr